when World <clears throat> when World of Warcraft came out in two thousand four, it was aimed at the casual market, the everyman. It was easy compared to other MMOs, and you could argue that convenience and ease of access is in the game's very lifeblood. However, over time. Blizzard have done a number of things, added a number of features which expedited the game, and sucked out the magic that this world once held and used to captivate millions of players. Why is that so? Well, because when you make something too easy breezy, it loses its worth. It's human nature to take pride in the fruits of our labor, but once you start introducing ways to expedite and automate a certain process, it loses its human element and becomes a mindless grind. In this video, I'll be talking about the reasons which I believe were responsible for the game losing its original charm, for the shift from old WoW to new WoW, how Blizzard changed the game irreversibly and how the developers and players' mindset shifted over time. When the game first came out, at its base level, new players were drawn in either by their general discourse on the internet or their friends who already spent time with the game enticing them to try it out. First impressions matter a lot, and a game which respects the time you put into it from the moment you create your character is bound to leave you wanting more. Now, in vanilla, nobody had any clue what they were doing, player and developer alike, so for the players, it was an era of exploration, of a new beginning. People talked to and interacted with each other, and toxicity was less rampant because the internet hadn't broken people's minds yet, so people were just playing the game, and its world was there to facilitate that. See. Leveling was the game, and WoW was sort of this after-school group chat. It was in many ways a predecessor to social media, so while leveling took a long time, it was a platform for people to interact with each other. It also took you all over the world of Warcraft. Quests were actually written, like there were stories in them, and the game didn't prioritize rewarding you as soon as possible. Instead, it would space out rewarding you with good, unique items that would last you a long time and make you, a new player, feel good for accomplishing a difficult task, and you and your group of friends could nerdgasm on vent whenever you got your first shoulder pads. PvP was also in its infancy. While world PvP was fun, it was the only way to battle players at first, and when battlegrounds were introduced, AV would last for days. The vanilla ranking system was bad in that it preferred quantity over quality. You didn't have to be that good, you just had to kill a lot of players every week. The internet in 2004 and 2005 was a completely different entity to what it is now. The normies and big corporations didn't get to it yet, it was still a mess, it was slow, connections were bad, so not a lot of people in vanilla looked at class tier lists, most optimal talents and enchants 1.12, it was more of a case of Hmm, I'm gonna roll a Night Elf Druid because I want to play the scantily clad lady from the game's cinematic trailer. Over the course of vanilla, the only things that they added were quality of life changes, and there's a difference between things that dumb the game down and quality of life changes which, well, improve it. Like, I don't think that anyone would argue that the options to select your final flight path or making daily quest markers blue instead of yellow ruined the game. TBC followed the winning formula of vanilla, adding more content such as the two new races and their starting zones, giving players even more choice, as well as balance changes, which were done to make the game enjoyable from start to end for whichever class you decided to roll. And the expansion was the perfect mix of just the right amount of endgame content coupled with an excellent leveling journey. That was the key to TBC's success at a time when the game was still experiencing massive growth and a constant influx of new players. However, in TBC, players were actually starting to get better at playing the game, and Blizzard were getting better at developing it, and it was the beginning of expansion-specific features. They were usually featured on the back of the box, and they were basically additions to the game used to draw in new and returning players, and showing them what awaited them in the endgame. It was a marketing gimmick, and for their first stunt, they added flying mounts. Flying changed the game, irreversibly. For the first time in three years, players, after reaching the new max level and shilling over a fat wad of cash, were able to unlock the expert and later artisan riding, and unshackle themselves from their earthly coil. Wrath of the Lich King introduced cold weather flying, learnable at level 77. This was slightly different from the actual flying introduced in TBC, because you didn't need to be max level to learn it, and that's because in Wrath, 
flying was interwoven into the leveling experience, with the two high level zones, Storm Peaks and Ice Crown, being made specifically with flying in mind. Also, the capital city for this expansion was literally a flying city suspended above Crystal Song Forest, and while there were obviously flight paths and ways to teleport to it, it's pretty obvious that Blizzard did it to incentivize flying mounts. This approach to world building showed a gradual change in the way that this game was being developed. Blizzard were starting to push flying more and more, making it a bigger part of not just the end game but also leveling, and it was the first feature which had both evidently positive and negative effects on the game. The positives being it making it quicker and easier to get around the world, avoiding pulling packs of mobs or getting ganked by a pack of rogues while earthbound, being able to go anywhere you wanted at any time. It was also a status symbol. We conquered the land during leveling and flying over it was not only a show of our prowess but also... I just want to get to the raid, man, like I'm max level and I don't want to be fucking running around everywhere gathered 10 chunks of boar meat looking ass. As for the negatives of flying, it hindered the community aspect. You wouldn't see players running around everywhere because flying allowed you to just get to your destination in the quickest way possible. It also destroyed the sense of mystery and exploration that the world might have previously had. The little sprinkles of world building that the devs would put in to tickle your imagination would no longer be needed. You could now fly anywhere by yourself, and complete and unrestrained freedom eventually leads to boredom. It no longer felt like you were in the world of Warcraft, you were simply above it. You were no longer forced to even look at other players, apart from in capital cities and the little spot where the summoning stone was. Perhaps no expansion represents the idea of changing WoW to facilitate flying more than Cataclysm, because that was like, literally the point of that expansion. You can watch my previous video where I talk extensively about how the Kata world revamp changed Azeroth and by extension WoW, but to cut a long story short, you could fly in the Eastern Kingdoms in Kalimdor now. Many people didn't like it, it was the beginning of Blizzard removing RPG elements from their MMORPG, in this case, the world building, and I feel like the next expansion, Mists of Pandaria, exemplifies this, because Blizzard made this beautiful continent full to the brim with lore, character, passion, only for players to mount up and fly above it, not giving a shit because they had to raid to attend. It was however around the time of MOP that Blizzard kind of conceded to the fact that flying was a mistake. And for their next expansion, Warlords of Draenor, they said that flying wouldn't be allowed. But players were angry that you wouldn't be able to fly because in TBC, giving players flying was like opening Pandora's box. Its addition was the first step on Blizzard's path to getting players addicted to convenience. Of course, flying wasn't the only reason why the game died. While it did help WoW ablute itself of its role-playing game status, it managed to expedite another element of the game which became increasingly redundant leveling. In the intro, I talked about how leveling was the game in its earliest iterations, however, that changed over time. During Wrath of the Lich King, the subgrowth stagnated, but the retention was still high, and thanks to hero classes, heirlooms and XP nerfs, even the Wrath babies quickly caught up and were at max level, doing endgame activities, cause that's what all the action was. So by the time Cataclysm released, Blizzard tried to accommodate this increasingly hermetic community by redesigning leveling. This was no longer a magical journey of adventure in an immersive world, because the people who still played WoW were min-maxers, who played for the max level experience, and the people who did actually start in Cataclysm were so enticed by the endgame that they threw on a power leveling guide and the game helped them by streamlining quests. You no longer needed to bounce back and forth between zones to complete lengthy quest lines because everything was within stone's throw reach so that you wouldn't have to run around the world and waste time that you should be spending getting experience instead. Removing unique, useless items which would only take precious development time away from max level content caused the novelty of the new quests to quickly wash away as you realized that none of what you were doing really mattered in the context of the endgame. Whatever zone you picked quickly became bland and samey as you received yet another piece of genetic quest reward gear, or not even because you probably had heirlooms on anyway. Now to be fair, they did make some aspects of leveling more enjoyable in terms of quest variety. Like, no longer was the majority of quests just spend 3 hours gathering 10 zebra hooves, but the vivacity of these new quests was somewhat vapid, especially in context to what they used to be. 
the new talent trees forced you into choosing a spec, already conditioning you into the endgame by removing the element of choice in an attempt to make you more statistically viable. Blizzard's abandonment of leveling became most evident when at the end of MOP, they introduced the paid level 90 character boost. Boosting was always a part of WoW, so it's difficult to blame Blizzard for trying to cash in on that market, but the way they approached and marketed it seemed like an admission by them that leveling was nothing but a chore anymore, that the real game awaited you at max level, and them saying things like, we priced the boost at $60 so as to not undermine the value of leveling is bullshit. You priced it at $60 because that was the maximum price that the marketing department considered worth the backlash. Ever since then, when a new expansion was announced and the level cap was raised yet again, the player base collectively eye-rolled, knowing that they would have to trudge through a few hours of useless bullshit before they could play the new expansion. And at the end of BFA, where the max level was twice its original value, they introduced the level squish. Everyone would be reduced to 50 and Shadowlands would raise the cap to 60, so they didn't actually change anything in terms of new expansion leveling. The only thing they did was completely fuck up the numerical balance of leveling so that every patch is either ridiculously under or overtuned. I suppose it has also made leveling quicker in general, which I'm not against because leveling to what would now be level 140 at pre-cataclysm pace would definitely not be a fun experience in a modern video game. Especially since WoW has a level cap at which the endgame starts, so you have to get through that journey first before you can engage with the content. The whole situation has led to a growing number of players saying that Blizzard should remove new expansion level caps or even leveling entirely because they see it as nothing more than an outdated hangover from the days of when World of Warcraft was an MMORPG. So that's how the RPG element of Blizzard's MMORPG died. But what about the other one? The word MMO, an abbreviation of Massively Multiplayer Online, implies that a game features a massive player base which plays together. The appeal of a game like that, then, would be playing with other people, right? While that might have been true in another time, over the course of the game's history, it seems like playing with other people has become more and more of a deterrent. This can be attributed to the aforementioned hermitism of the WoW community, and Blizzard doing everything to retain their existing player base by appealing to min-max culture and ironing out any imperfections which might come as a result of interpersonal friction. Wrath of the Lich King was the first expansion into which Blizzard openly added a feature designed to automate the game. Looking for Dungeon LFD is the tool used to queue for a dungeon which will then automatically match you with 4 other players and teleport you to said dungeon so you can do your thing. It reduces the human element of forming your own group, choosing people with whom to do a dungeon and then going there to the click of a button, and breaks immersion during leveling because you can be doing quests in your chosen zone and suddenly get a loud ass notification, then get plucked from spacetime into whatever instance the game decides to chuck you into. And with the addition of cross realm groups in 4.2, Blizzard started to move away from the community aspect of You're servers trash. to make your queue spot faster. Server which in effect made the whole dungeoning experience alienating, because you'd spawn into a dungeon with four people that you've never seen before and will probably never see again, but it was introduced to the game halfway through Wrath, which, as I discussed, was around the time when the game's focus was shifting solely to endgame. So while it did kill a social element of the game, I believe it to be a necessary evil that in the end helped this increasingly self-contained player base. And as you've probably noticed by now, Immersion breaking features are exactly what helped facilitate the change from old WoW to new WoW. Anyways, what do you do when you have a winning formula to automate small group content that proves time efficient? <laughs> well, make it bigger of course. Looking for raid is a tool which makes it easier for players to experience max level raid content without the hassle of dealing with guilds and organization, putting in the time to learn classes or mechanics or anything really. It was added in 4.3 so that the dying player base would experience the epic final raid of Cataclysm even after all their guildies quit. Its existence undermines the value of the so coveted endgame content in this game. Mechanics have to be heavily dumbed down and enemy damage is cosmetic because you can't organize 20ish people without any means of communication other than a chat box, which in turn decreases the awesome factor of defeating a canonically powerful enemy. 
but this is once again Blizzard removing the element of RPG progression in order to accommodate players who want to auto-attack Archimonde or Argus while watching YouTube on their second screen. Anyone who's a regular raider and goes into LFR can attest that it's an absolutely horrible experience, with people leaving after one wipe or just because they felt like it. You have 20 people spamming one chat channel at the same time, either trolling or being toxic, so you have to scroll back to read whatever the raid leader, who isn't actually the raid leader, said. It's a complete mess that is in no way representative of organized raiding, which was the norm up to that point, and which new players or non-raiders have no incentive to try out because half of them will think that it's as bad of an experience as LFR, and the other half will be content playing their shitty game and getting their shitty loot. However, for those who want to play more than just LFR, what changed? While most of the things I've discussed so far have been about how the game shifted squarely into the max level experience, let's actually talk about it. World of Warcraft's max level experience can be distilled into one word, loot. Loot has always been the end goal of World of Warcraft. Almost every activity ever put into the game is a way to get loot. Since vanilla was such a simple game compared to what it would become, gear was the single most sought after element and Blizzard knew that. They knew how much people enjoyed the progression of being just a fucking guy dressed in rags to this epic swagged out powerhouse with items that had purple text and were modeled with more than 3 pixels and probably a particle effect that your PC was too shit to process anyway. That progression was relatively simple but very time consuming and a large part of the player base were kids and teenagers whose biggest worries in life were math homework, humanity still had an attention span, and people were bad at the game. These three things made vanilla into a complete clusterfuck, and considering how many people joined the game all throughout its gestation period, a lot of them didn't even get to, let alone complete the endgame. But those who did were rewarded appropriately with items deserving the epic classification. Because things were so simple back then, Good gear was just good, and it would last you like forever, like I'm pretty sure that Thunder Fury was still used for tanking in Black Temple. The endgame loop in World of Warcraft pretty much stayed the same from vanilla until Warlords of Draenor, however, small changes were made over time, such as the addition of dailies and heroic dungeons in TBC, which were Blizzard's first attempts at retention mechanics that would keep players logging in every day as opposed to just raid logging. In order to see what it started going wrong for Blizzard, we must once again look at Wrath and the addition of Trial of the Crusader. TOC is generally considered as the first time that Blizzard took an L in terms of the endgame experience. It was added too quickly following Ulduar through which players were still progressing and invalidated it. It was added simply to pad out the time between Ulduar and ICC and players saw through that. Its invalidation of a previous raid tier was the beginning of a pattern where the addition of the new raid tier started invalidating the previous ones, and the gradual shift towards seasonality which would eventually change the game from a linear progression system into on and off player activity. This hurt the game in terms of endgame retention, because while originally upon hitting max level, a player would have to go through all the previous raid tiers and progress linearly, now you could just jump into the newest, freshest content as soon as you hit max level. Legion tried to solve this retention problem by introducing Mythic Plus, finally giving dungeons their due as a legitimate endgame activity. It proved a success because it was repeatable constantly, you didn't have to worry about lockouts, and while it granted powerful gear, it didn't invalidate raiding, you still needed it for tier sets. The issue with Legion however, is that while it added one good retention mechanic, it also added a very bad one. Borrowed power. Infinitely upgradable systems are not inherently a bad thing, especially in MMOs, however WoW wasn't created with that in mind. Its endgame progression has always focused on two year long expansions, and adding infinite power so late into its lifespan meant that the game was faced with one difficult question. What's next? Every single element of the previous expansion which made it good was ruined with the release of BFA. When Blizzard didn't know what to do with borrowed power, they did it again but worse, and now it came at the cost of tier sets, and because they added so much useless shit into the game which rewarded that borrowed power, you had no choice but to do it. Basically, Blizzard, in response to players complaining about a lack of things to do other than raiding, 
decided to pad the game out with time sync player retention ass mechanics, which only got worse as time progressed, culminating in Shadowlands, which is a can of worms that I've already discussed. And the game in its entirety was at this point so far removed from original WoW that it might have as well been a different game. The last element of the game I want to talk about is the story. World of Warcraft continued the story of Warcraft 3, picking up four years after the defeat of Archimonde. The Horde was now a thing, Illidan went into hiding in Outland, and Arthas became the Lich King. And those last two plot points were the focus of the first two WoW expansions. But before that, we had to kill a dragon. M make that two dragons. And a lizard with wings. And an eye. And the Lich King's second in command, but not really because we gave his phylactery to some fucking guy. Vanilla WoW's story was a bit all over the place, but that's because making an MMO where players take on the role of just some random adventurers was different than Warcraft 3, where you controlled whole armies spearheaded by heroes with a pre-written story. So Blizzard had this whole fantasy universe, and now was their chance to expand on it. Warcraft 3's plot points would be finished, yes, but first they had to establish this new way in which their universe would be written. They needed us, the player characters, or as we would be known in-universe, heroes of the Horde and Alliance, to become canonically powerful so that we could even be a match for the mighty villains Illidan and Arthas. So Vanilla put us through a gauntlet of increasingly powerful enemies, and that made sense from an RPG perspective. When we started, we were essentially military volunteers with no prior experience, so the game gradually ramped up the stakes. During leveling, we would battle increasingly powerful enemies, and the stakes kept getting higher, and the rewards kept getting better, until we were ready to step into raids, so at the end of Vanilla, our characters deserved the mantle of champion, hero, etc. TBC, then, tackled the first unfinished plot point of Warcraft 3. The Dark Portal opened once again, and now the powerful heroes of Azeroth stormed into Outland, defeated the remaining Burning Legion infestation, killed Illidan's lieutenants, and finally defeated him atop the Black Temple. But he wasn't actually the final boss of the expansion, because in Warcraft 3, Kill Jaden was actually the boss of Illidan, so we had to kill the boss of the boss. After TBC, it was the time to defeat the final boss of the Warcraft universe. Prince Arthas Menethil, who was now the Lich King, was sort of, kind of the main character of Warcraft 3. The whole game essentially storied his downfall from a noble paladin to blue Darth Vader. People were invested in his story since Warcraft 3. There was even a book written about his whole life so that we were 100% knowledgeable about him because it was time to sail to Northrend and defeat him once and for all. So at this point, the story of Warcraft 3 had concluded. It seemed like peace was finally within arm's reach. All the villains were dead, so the logical step would be to end World of Warcraft and continue the story in another game, either Warcraft 4 or WoW 2, right? Wrong. World of Warcraft made a lot of money and Blizzard, or Activision Blizzard, were not going to shut down this money printer that they had on their hands, so they had to continue, and they still had a villain on their hands that they could milk for money, Deathwing. After we, or Thrall, defeated the Destroyer, the game meandered aimlessly around its universe, looking for things here and there, but because the story didn't have the backing of Warcraft 3, many people saw it as them running out of ideas, and while they did have a few good things here and there, a lot of the staff who were responsible for creating the Warcraft universe in the first place had at that point left Blizzard, and the game was left in the hands of people who didn't really know what to do with this legacy that had been bestowed upon them. And the story of the game got so bad, felt so alien and on Warcraft that for many people it became a complete meme and nobody even cared about it anymore. It was sad to think that this company were at one point responsible for making some of the greatest games and writing some of the best stories compared to the absolute laughingstock that their new stories had become. After the recent controversy and subsequent restructuring of the company, they have tried to bring some good old Warcraft back into the game, and even though it looks decent, it's now so far entrenched in modern politics that it's become so glossy, polished and flawless, losing a lot of its edge and original appeal which would nowadays be considered problematic. So to conclude, I've looked at 5 elements of the game and how they changed over time, how player attitudes changed over the course of the game and what Blizzard did to adapt to that change, and in every element I was able to narrow it down to a window of time when World of Warcraft stopped being an MMORPG and became a race towards statistical supremacy. 
Now I'm not saying that modern WoW is bad on principle. A live game is bound to see change, especially when it's existed for so long and has been as successful as World of Warcraft. Times change and people no longer play games for a sense of magical escapism. They see them for what they are, ones and zeros, which can be exploited to the point where nothing is left to the imagination anymore. No stone is left unturned, no information is unknowable. WoW is never going to be this grand adventure that you can completely immerse yourself in. Your whole world can no longer be reduced to a 4x3 CRT display. The release of Classic is a prime example of that. Sure, a lot of people played it for the nostalgia trip, but for many people it was just an escape from retail, which at that point became fucking unbearable. The no changes approach to Classic made people realize that what was once intimidating and unconquerable was now trivial. And once everyone realized that and decided, mm, yes, maybe some changes, Blizzard immediately showered it with modern game design. So, World of Warcraft lost its soul not only because it got bad, but because the internet kinda got bad. I guess there are only two ways out of this rut. Make retail good, which, so far, they have been doing that in Dragonflight, or release Classic Plus, which is a giant question mark over the whole franchise and a discussion for another time.